Hi, everybody. Some of you will remember a time when if you wanted to know something, you had to either pull out an encyclopedia to look it up or go to the library. And if you wanted to know what was happening in the world, you had to wait until the news came on at night, at supper, or until you got your newspaper. Now we Google everything. There's a lot of information out there. I freely admit that I went a bit overboard looking into this, but I Googled the craziest things that people Google. And here are some of the results. Why does my husband fart so much? How many calories are in a booger? Can you still eat 3,000 year old honey? Why do I have no friends? Does your virginity grow back? That was scary. Why can't I own a Canadian? Is it healthy to drink your own urine? Surprisingly, over 4,000 people a month ask Google, how do I do a Google search? And over a thousand people every month ask, how do I hide a dead body? One of the most often asked questions is, am I pregnant? And over 40,000 people a month ask, why did I get married? Now I have to say, I laughed at some of those quite a bit. You know, there's a lot of difference between looking for information and figuring out how to use that information. I mean, what on earth is, what practical use is there uh, in the information about whether or not you can drink your own urine or how much the caloric value is of a booger. Who, who, what, what use to that, to you in your life is that information? Well, we are in the life of Solomon now and last week we learned that God gave Solomon an opportunity to get anything from God that he chose and Solomon asked for wisdom. He knew that he needed discernment and wisdom if he was going to do a good job leading the nation. And he asked, and God gave him wisdom in abundance. I gave you a definition of wisdom last week from Packard. And he said, wisdom is the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. Wisdom is not information. Information is what we know. Wisdom is the ability to decide well, to decide rightly what to do with what we know. It is the ability to manage the complexities of life well. Wisdom must seep down into the cracks of our everyday life. Sometimes in life things aren't all that clear. There are no guidelines in scripture for some of the things that we face. The Bible doesn't tell you how to handle your online presence or how much screen time is healthy for your children. It doesn't tell you how to navigate the use of the internet or how to deal with haters on social media. It doesn't even tell you whether you are better off putting your kids in public or private school. And this is where we need wisdom in these less than clear cut questions to figure out how what we know of God is to be applied to a particular situation. Solomon wrote a book about wisdom and we spent this week in that book in Proverbs. Proverbs is not a narrative, it's not a story, it is a collection of wise sayings, bits of good advice collected and recorded for us. It gives us some suggestions about how to make our decisions in life and we need those. Because did you know that we make 35,000 decisions every day? Proverbs addresses marriage and family life, business and finance, morality, work, and many other day-to-day -day issues. These sayings, these bits of advice are loosely organized, but there's not a lot of structure to the book. Some portions are written by Solomon, other bits are written and collected and added during the time of King Hezekiah. Chapter 30 is written by a man named Eger, and the last chapter by King Lemuel, whoever those two guys are. Solomon says he got a lot of advice from his father and he inserts some of that into the book. Um, and King Lemuel writes about advice his mother gave him about what to look for in a wife. Now the main theme of the book, the theme that undergirds all the specific bits of advice is wisdom. Wisdom is personified in Proverbs. That means human descriptions and attributes are given to an abstract concept in order to help the audience understand it. Solomon employs this literary device and describes wisdom as a woman. Fun fact for you, Proverbs 10 uh, through 22, 6 consists of 375 wise sayings from Solomon. Now you likely already know that every leader, every, sorry, 
every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a numeric value. So if you add up the letters, the Hebrew letters in a name and the value of it, you get a total um, numeric value for the name. And the letters in the name of Solomon in Hebrew add up to 375. So now you have something with which to win the trivia contest at Christmas with your family this year. We're told in Proverbs that wisdom comes from God. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Since it comes from God, it's a value. <coughs> Excuse me. Wisdom is worth having because it comes from God. Wisdom has its source in God. A natural question arises then, well, how do we get wisdom? You can't order it from Amazon, so how do we get it? Solomon gives us two answers to that. And the first is that we need to seek wisdom. Solomon tells us that we don't seek wisdom to get smarter, but to get smaller. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear here is not terror. It's holy reverence and respect, specifically for God. 1533 says, the fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom and humility comes before honor. As we grow in understanding who God is in the greatness of his presence, and as we reverence him for who he is, we are going to see our own smallness. We are going to have humility as our sense of his greatness and our smallness becomes more real to us, we will gain wisdom. As we seek him and get to know him, we become wise. We come to understand that he is God and I am not. Solomon goes on to say that we are to seek wisdom as if it is a treasure. And I'm going to read from chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Treasure incites people to dedicated effort. Lots of people put all their time and money and, and energy into getting money or hunting for treasure. I'm sure some of you have seen or heard of the TV show, The Curse of Oak Island. And these guys are investing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in a search for some buried treasure that is supposed to be on this island. So far, I don't think they found a lot, but they're committed to searching. Proverbs 8, 10 to 11 says, Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare to her. And then further down in 8, 17, it says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Those who seek wisdom are not only to search for it as treasure, but to seek it as if seeking a loved one. Those who seek her will find her. You know how you should search for a missing child, right? I was in Hawaii not long after Len was killed with my friend and my son, Robbie. And we were on the grounds of this big hotel and we saw a small boy walking along looking scared. We tried to talk to him, but he did not answer. Turns out we discovered he actually didn't speak any English at all. He was maybe around five and he's, I think, Eastern European. We concluded that he was lost, and so thinking it was not a good idea these days to touch him or to try to take him anywhere, we just stood there, my friend stood there with him, and Robbie and I began to look for help. I notified a member of the hotel staff who contacted the main desk, and Robbie went in search for someone who seemed to be looking anxiously for a child. And after a bit, Robbie saw this man walking very calmly along and looking around, but not overly concerned looking. And Robbie asked if he was searching for a child. Long story short, this is the boy's father and the rest of the family showed up. Only one of them spoke English, but my friend and I were looking at each other and, and said, if this was my kid, I'd have been like way more terrified and anxious than this dad was. Um, now, maybe the boy had only been missing for a minute when we found him. Maybe dad had just started searching and hadn't panicked yet because most parents would search with much more intensity than that. That's how we're to search for wisdom, with the intensity of one looking for a lost loved one. 
In essence, seeking, the wis seeking wisdom is seeking God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As you seek God, as you reverence God and hold him in holy awe, you will find wisdom. You will not get a bunch of information or gain a block of knowledge. Instead, you will grow to know God and see him for who he is. Humility before the greatness of God is, a ne is necessary to gain wisdom. Wisdom rem remembers that God is God and I am not. Seeking wisdom results in living smaller, not smarter. Proverbs 11, chapter 2, with humility comes wisdom. Solomon was famous for many things, for his wisdom, for his riches, for the glory of his court, but his, it was his awareness that he needed something more, something from God to be a successful king that was the key. So calling himself a little child, he asked humbly for wisdom that he needed to reign well, and he was given that for which he asked. Seeking wisdom is a choice. It's a choice made because we see our own smallness. We know we need something from God to help us live well and make good decisions. Seeking wisdom requires some effort to seek it as a treasure, to seek it diligently as if for a lost child. These require us to put in some sweat equity. What stops you from seeking God, from seeking wisdom from God with this sort of diligence? Is it the need for smallness? Not everyone wants to seek something that requires humility. Why do you struggle? Why do I? With accepting the greatness of God and our own smallness. How much value do you put on wisdom? Or do you rely on human wisdom and human understanding and think that's enough? If we don't see wisdom's great value, we won't be so willing to seek it, to hunt for it diligently. What is the greatest value to you and why? Wisdom impacts all areas of life for good, and it is to be sought as great treasure. So having learned that we find wisdom by seeking it, there's another thing Solomon tells us in Proverbs. We find wisdom by trusting it. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And this was Solomon's experience. He asked, and boom, wisdom fell on him. Sometimes we think this means that everything is going to be easy. We are now easily going to know and instantly know the right thing to do in every situation. Proverbs will be easy. I mean, not sorry. Problems will be, have easy and clear-cut answers. We will not make mistakes or sin against what we know. And everything's going to work out. Check, click, voila, no pain, all gain. But in my experience, that's not how life works. No, there is a gap between the asking and the solution. The solution often doesn't look the way I thought it would. The answers were not what I was looking for. There is some pain in the solution, some loss or some struggle, or there is a long time between the seeking of wisdom for the problem and what God does to solve it. Sometimes the thing God does just seems worse. So we struggle with this gap. We have a problem. We ask God for help and for wisdom to guide our steps and what he does and what he leads us to do does not seem best. What we think ought to happen and what we experience do not match and that gap calls for trust. In essence, wisdom has to be learned. God has to teach us his ways and we have to remain teachable to learn wisdom. Verses many of you have as your life verse are found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which I'm sure most of you could quote. I'm going to read it so I don't make any mistakes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Great verses, but they seem a bit deceptively simple. Trust in the Lord and everything will instantly straighten out. Sometimes it takes a long time to get to the straight stretch. It's not an instantaneous thing. <clears throat> Sometimes the solution God leads you to take is going to have a cost. Let me give you an example that I know of. A couple of partners in a company were dissolving it. The assets, the liquid cash of the company was divided to both of them and distributed as dividends, which is taxable income. But they missed something. 
There was an outstanding debt to one of the owners who had lent money to the company when it began, and that debt should have been repaid. An accident caught, an, or sorry, an accountant caught this and told the owner to whom the debt was owed that that owner had the legal right to demand that the other partner repay the dividend and that money come to the one to whom the debt was owed. This would have been tax free because the money was the partner's own money that he had invested in the company. Between the taxes and the money that should have been repaid by the other partner, there was about $15,000 on the line. This is not a small thing. But God led the one partner to see that what God wanted was for things to be left as they were. To ask for the money back would cause hard feelings between the two partners, both of whom were believers. It would put the one partner at distress in having to pay it back. And so God's wisdom said, just take the loss of the $15,000. Ouch. Wisdom isn't always pain-free. It isn't always easy. So we have to be teachable. We have to be willing to learn wisdom. Even Solomon did this. He writes in Ecclesiastes, another book that he wrote of various things he investigated and the conclusions he came to as what is best and right. He writes phrases in this book like, this I tested, 723. Then I realized, 518. So I saw, 322. And he ends with, now all has been heard and here is the conclusion of the matter. And that's Ecclesiastes 12:13. He was wise but he was teachable. Proverbs 16, 20, whoever gives heed to instruction prospers and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Teachability includes correction. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12 says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father and the son he delights in. Trusting wisdom is a choice to remain teachable. Trusting wisdom, in essence, means trusting God. It means trusting the guidance he provides, even when it seems odd or is not understandable. It means trusting his timing and his plans when we cannot see them. Wisdom helps us learn to wait on God and to be sure that his way is best, that he means all things for our good, and that he is acting in love even when it doesn't look as if that could be true. Wisdom calls for faith in God in the gap between what we would like or expect and what we get from the hands of God. Faith in God, confidence in what we know of him, will teach us further wisdom that will translate into other situations in our lives in the future. We learn and grow in our understanding of God and in our trust in him, and we gain wisdom in the process. Are you looking at a gap between what you wanted or thought you needed and what you have so far received from God? What is God saying to you regarding seeking and trusting wisdom? What truth about God do you need to remind yourself about in order to trust and grow in wisdom and dependence on God? In what situation are you unsure of direction? God promises to guide and promises to freely give wisdom to those who ask. It may not lead you where you expect, but God's way is always best. How can you seek him today? There are things we need to address before leaving the book of Proverbs behind. First, something that helps us understand the gaps between what we think should happen and what does happen. It's important to know that Proverbs is, that the Proverbs are not promises. They are not guarantees. They are probabilities. They are the trends in life. They are generalities. If you think of them as promises or guarantees, you could end up questioning yourself in unfair ways or judging others unfairly. For example, let's talk about Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord gives length to life. Now, you and I likely all have known someone who loved and feared the Lord and did not get long life. They died young. If you take this verse as a promise, it may lead you to think God was unfair and not keeping his word, or to think that the person who died was not actually fearing the Lord, did not actually love and obey God. You could end up thinking that God owes you a long life due to your faithfulness to him. 
Another example is chapter six, sorry, chapter 22, verse six, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. This too can lead us to judge others or be hard on ourselves when a family seems to parent well, or when we do our very best as parents and a child walks away from the Lord as a young adult. But these are not guarantees or promises. They are trends. If you train up a child in the way they should go, they are certainly more likely to remain in that as an adult than if they were not trained up in it in the first place. So it is important that we not judge others or be hard on ourselves or distrust God in those gaps because we thought they were guarantees. I also briefly want to address the superwoman who is described in Proverbs 31, this woman of virtue. She seems to live on a level of production and success that's hard to measure up to. Lots of women really get discouraged when they read this chapter, especially if their husband is holding up this woman as an example of how we should live as wives. Now Solomon has a habit in this book of personification. He personifies several other attributes as women. Wisdom, as I already mentioned, is personified as a woman, but so too are folly and adultery. 8, 4 through 9, 6, 9, 13 to 18, and chapter 5, 3 to 10, if you want to look them up yourself. So it seems likely that virtue is being personified in chapter 31. These four personified women sit in contrasting pairs, wisdom versus folly and adultery versus virtue. Wisdom lived should produce virtue, and folly lived will produce unfaithfulness, at least spiritual unfaithfulness. So I want to suggest to you this may not be, in chapter 31, an actual woman, nor a standard for womanhood or wife, wifehood, but rather it shows us how wisdom would look when lived in the various situations of life. It shows us the character that wisdom produces, Integrity, loyalty, hospitality, diligence, strength. You might find that rather less intimidating than thinking that you have to stay all night, up all night sewing clothes for all the members of your family. So what do we conclude about wisdom? We can't get it by placing an order on eBay. We can't find, it, find out all about how to do this through a Google search. Wisdom depends on a relationship with God. We seek him and trust him. We ask him for wisdom for the challenges of life, and he gives freely, although not always, the way we expect. I'm going to read some verses from back in chapter 1 again, starting at verse 20. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke, then I will pour out my thoughts to you and I will make known to you my teachings. Drop down to verse 32. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear at harm. And then finally, verse three, sorry, chapter three, verse seven, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. Do you want wisdom? Are you gonna Google it or seek it from God?